What we celebrate this morning, and every Sunday morning, and to be quite honest, every morning for that fact, is the good news that Jesus rose from the dead victorious over sin and death. Now, I understand we live in a modern time, and, and so we don't believe in fairy tales, which is actually how the news of Jesus' resurrection has been viewed since it occurred 2,000 years ago. Whether it's atheists, whether it's, I'll put it in quotes, ministers in the church who preach uh, that the resurrection was not a physical resurrection. Instead, they might say that it was something spiritual that occurred there. People have been questioning. People have been pushing back, people have been mocking the idea that the tomb that Jesus was laid in is empty. From the moment the news first began to disseminate out, even the Pharisees, the religious leaders at that time said, he's not risen, the the body was stolen, the disciples stole his body. Paul, once converted, years later, is traveling preaching the gospel. He comes to Athens. He is talking with the philosophers and the the teachers, the thinkers of that day. And when he starts talking about the resurrection, they laugh at him. How crazy are you to believe that a man could die and rise again? It was a challenge even for the young church. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians and Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth because there are people there who are thinking some of these things. At first, they're thinking maybe Jesus really didn't raise from the grave, or there are some people who are saying, well, what about the people who died before Jesus returns? What about those people? They're going to miss the, the glorious new life we have. What about those folks The reality is, is if you really want to attack the Christian faith, where you go is to the resurrection. You go to the tomb. Because if there's no resurrection, there's no Christian faith. If you remove the resurrection, you pull the linchpin out, and everything else crumbles around it, no resurrection, no faith. No resurrection, no hope. So, that's what we're going to look at, the resurrection, the good news that Jesus is no longer dead, but is risen victorious. Before we do that, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day that we could gather here and remember the good news. He is risen. He is alive. And in him, we all can find life find forgiveness, find hope, have strength and peace amidst the chaos of this life. And Lord, I pray that, that for those of us who already believe and hold firm to this truth, that this would be a glorious reminder of what we believe. But I also pray, Lord, that you'd be working already in those who do not know you, those who maybe mock or deny the, res- the resurrection, those who maybe think there's no need for Jesus in their life, they got it all under control. Help them to see how little control they have and how good the news is that Jesus has conquered sin, has had victory over death, and has promised us a great and glorious inheritance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was younger, I remember first hearing about uh, Eric Weiss. He fascinated me. This man was amazing. He could get out of anything. And you probably know who he is. You just don't know him by his real name. You know him more by his stage name, Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini would be handcuffed, he'd be tied up, he'd be shoved into a trunk, and then they would chain around the trunk, and then they would throw the trunk into the river, and a few minutes later, Harry would come swimming up to the surface. They would take him, and he would be taken by prisoner guards and put in straight jackets and locked in a prison cell, and he'd find a way to escape even that. In fact, in World War I, he would train 
uh, soldiers in New York City before they took the boat over to Europe to teach them how to escape if they were ever handcuffed or tied up. He had the ability to get out of anything. He and his wife made a deal. Here's the deal. If Harry died first, because he was such an amazing escape artist, he was going to show or find a way to show her that he made it to the other side, that, that he's okay. Here's the thing that's a little bit interesting that you might not know about Harry Houdini is towards the end of his life, he actually spent a lot of time trying to debunk mystics and fortune tellers and people would have those seances to talk with the dead and he would, you know, show them as frauds. So I always thought this was a little odd that he did this, but I think the point was you can't come back from the dead. Harry ended up dying before his wife and for 10 years his wife kept vigil, waiting to see this sign from Harry from the other side. And after 10 years, she was done waiting, and I appreciate her her little statement, her quib, was 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. And she was done, and she moved on. Death's grip was too much even for Harry Houdini. The guy who could get out of anything could not escape the imprisonment of death. If there is hope for this life and the next, it hinges on the idea of resurrection. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It will come up on the screen, but if you want, you can grab the the Pew Bible in front of you, and it's on page 904. And if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that Bible home. That's yours. Paul, like I said, he's writing to this church and, and there's questions about resurrection. There's questions about, you know, is there a resurrection? Is it a physical resurrection? All these other things. And he says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be looking at verses 12 through 19. He says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as, ris- as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ whom He did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. What Paul is trying to say here in these verses is simply put this. If there's no resurrection, there's no good news. There's no Christian faith if there's no resurrection. Good Friday is only good because there is Resurrection Sunday. And if there's no Resurrection Sunday, you don't have Good Friday, you only have Black Friday, and that day's already taken for the day after Thanksgiving. The resurrection is the linchpin of our entire faith. No resurrection, Christ is still dead, there's no hope. Why are we here? We're wasting our time. If Jesus is dead, if his body was stolen, right? That's what some people said. Oh, the disciples came. They somehow snuck around the Roman guard, you know, these well-trained unit that if they fell asleep on the job, they could actually be put to death. They somehow snuck in like ninjas, stole Jesus' body. But guess what? Jesus is still dead. They have a dead body. If Mary and and the disciples and the Pharisees, maybe they got lost in the garden and they, they went to the wrong tomb and they're like, oh, the body's not here. But really he was like, you know, two tombs over and they, they, you know, whatever. Like, I mean, that's some of the things people throw out on like, here's why he didn't really raise from the dead. If Jesus is still dead, it destroys the very supportive structure of our entire faith. Paul writes in verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. 
If Jesus is in the tomb, there's no good news. What are we preaching? We're preaching lies. The resurrection reveals that Jesus' life, his perfect life, lived in your place, was pleasing and acceptable to God. That's why God rose him up from the dead. The resurrection reveals that Jesus has victory over death, right? The wage of sin is death. You sin, that's why we die. You sin, all of us sin, that's why we die. But Jesus' resurrection shows that he covered over sin and so removed its consequence, its payment, death. The promise of newness of life, the forgiveness of sins, the renewal of of the hope that we have of a great new world being created, having an eternal righteous king ruling over that world forever and ever, gone if there's no resurrection. It means our preaching is foolish. It's in vain. But Paul continues that it means your very faith or our very faith is in vain. A dead bridegroom can't rescue his bride. We might as well just eat, drink, and be merry, live selfish lives because this is all we got. Celebrate, do whatever you want because the reality is you and I were just food for worms. That's it. The faith of those that we read of in Hebrews 11, which is known as that that the hall of faith where all these people were seeking to to live their lives for God and yet they kept looking for a greater and a future kingdom in which the writer of Hebrews says they, they saw at a distance. They didn't experience it fully, but they saw it at a distance missionaries, uh, pastors, uh, Christians who have shed their blood for the very sake of the gospel have spilt their blood as fools. It's vain. It's foolishness. Pointless. Paul goes on and he says, if there's no resurrection, verse 15, he and other ministers of the gospel, and I include myself in that group, are misrepresenting God. How are they misrepresenting God? They're saying God did something that he did not do. They're saying that God approved of Jesus' life. That's why he was resurrected. But if he didn't actually resurrect, that means God didn't approve of his life. That means he didn't actually accomplish anything. He just died like any other person who was ever crucified. They're saying that Jesus is the way. They're saying that Jesus is the one where you find your hope. It's through Jesus that you can obtain God, which if that's not true, we're misrepresenting God. They are misrepresenting God because they're saying He alone is where hope is found. They're deceiving others into believing a lie about God. They're leading people away from God. They are misrepresenting God because they're turning his narrative of redemption into a fairy tale. It's just make belief. In verse 17, he continues, If Christ is not raised, your faith is futile, and you are in your sins. Jesus' life and death accomplish nothing if there's no resurrection. Sin remains on all of us. Because none of us are perfect. All of us have sinned. All have gone astray, seeking our own way. All of us deserve the wage, which is death. Woe to me. Woe to you. We're just sinners in the hands of a righteous, holy God. If there's no resurrection, Paul tells us in verse 18, That those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, that's what he means by fall asleep there, they've perished. This life is it. There's no hope. There's no life after death. And if that's the case, all of us will one day die and experience the full wrath of God because there's no way to redeem ourselves. There's no way around it. If Jesus died and we've put our hope in a fanciful dream that's really a deception, you're left with nothing. We're fools. 
We are to be pitied, Paul says, verse 19. If Christ is not raised from the dead, we are to be most pitied. Think about that. Like, here's an example I was thinking of. If, imagine, if you will, that a, a woman, uh, excuse me, a man asks a woman to marry her, him, right? They get engaged, and before they're married, he breaks off the engagement, right? Now, imagine this woman still goes and buys the wedding dress, still pays for the venue, still, you know, uh, sends out invitations, still, uh, you know, puts down a deposit for the venue, pays the musicians. You know, she does all these things. If you knew that this guy is never coming back for her, you would look at her life and you would be like, man, I pity this woman. She is so deceived. She is, oh man, my heart breaks for her for how pathetic she is. The reality is if there's no resurrection, that's true of us. It's actually worse than that for us. Because if there's no resurrection, no groom has even invited us to be married to him at any point. There's no hope. There's no life. There's nothing. But yet here we are trying to get ready for a wedding that's never going to happen. We are fools prepping for a groom who's never going to come and get us. Because if there's no resurrection, there's no hope. Our faith in Jesus is in vain, it's futile, it's worthless, it's pointless if there's no resurrection. Here's the key here. If you've been reading through this passage and you've been hearing the language I've been using, Paul keeps saying, if, if there's no resurrection, if Christ is still dead, if, 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 Paul is talking in hypotheticals. Hypothetically, if this happened, or hypothetically, if it did not happen, or if it this, or if that, what Paul is trying to say is those are hypotheticals. The reality is Christ is risen. Therefore, our faith is trustworthy. Christ is risen. Our Faith is trustworthy. We know that Paul it doesn't have this, not, I'm not really sure if he rose or not rose, because a couple verses earlier, he says in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 3, he says this, For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received. What's of first importance? That Christ died for our sins according with the Scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas. That's just another name for Peter. Then to the Twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Though some have fallen asleep, some have died. Paul is saying... The death and resurrection of Jesus shouldn't come as a shock or surprise. The Scriptures, talk about the Old Testament, have been pointing to this reality. This is going to happen this way. And then he says, he, he rose and he interacted with people. Right? He saw Peter, he saw the twelve. He didn't just see the people who are in his closest unit. Right? He interacts with 500 brothers. And I want to point out, there's probably some sisters involved in there too. Right? Like, so he's, he's being seen by a lot of people. And not just seen, they eat with him. They touch him. They interact with him. They know he's physical. They, they, they're, they're putting their hands on him. He has been seen. It's not a mass hallucination. That's just not how hallucinations work. If you have a bunch of people tripping out on some sort of mass hallucination, they're not seeing the same thing. They're not hearing the same thing. They're not experiencing the same thing. It's just not how hallucinations work. To put your faith in the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not a foolish act. It's not something done in vain. It's actually quite, it's actually the opposite of that. It's not foolish, it's not in vain. It's it's the the best, wisest, 
most gracious, good thing you could do. The resurrection reveals that Jesus is faithful and true. His resurrection affirms that he has the power, that he has the victory over our greatest enemies. I remember sitting at a wedding, having a conversation with a gentleman who said, you're a pastor, right? And I said, yes. And he says, so you believe in that whole resurrection thing, right? And I said, yes. And he said, why? Now, be it he was a little inebriated. I didn't go into super detail because I wasn't sure how much he was going to remember but as we were talking, I was, I was saying, because it's the center of our faith. The resurrection is the center of our faith. And here's why I believe it actually happened. And walked him through all of these things and kind of helped debunk some of the, the false beliefs of maybe what happened. And because I said, if there's no resurrection, you're right, I am pitiful and pathetic. But because there is a resurrection, I should be envied. Church. Christ is alive, therefore we are to be envied. And by envied, I don't mean like this like arrogant, like, look at how amazing I am. I have Jesus. You should want to be me. I'm not talking about that kind of envy. I'm talking about like if the reality is if you are dead in your sins and you don't know Christ, there's destruction here. There's hopelessness here. But if you have Christ, there's, there's life and hope. Wouldn't you envy the people who have life and hope? When you look at them and be like, I want what you have. Paul writes in verse 19 that if Christ was not raised, we Christians are to be pitied above all people. But because Christ rose from the grave, we aren't to be pitied, we're to be envied. I want what you have. If there's no future hope, we are pathetic fools. But the tomb's empty, and there is a future home. Jesus is alive. It's funny, as I was sitting about that conversation at the wedding, and that guy was asking me about these things and kind of pitying me because I'm a stupid, ignorant Christian who makes his living preaching the gospel and believing in fairy tales, I think about how the world itself even views it. How does the world view the world? I always appreciated that the preacher of the book of Ecclesiastes put it this way. He says, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, it's all vanity. It's chasing after wind. And if, 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 if your only thought of this life is just eat and drink for tomorrow we die, that really doesn't bring much value to life, does it? Like, what's, Really? You pity me? I, I remember as a kid, growing up, we had, uh, we had some family vehicles that didn't have air conditioning in them, right? I know, like way back in the day before air conditioning was in everybody's car, we had to crank the windows down, right? So as a kid, you'd crank the window down because you're like, oh, yeah. We had like vinyl seats. Who ever thought of that? Like, hey, no AC, vinyl seats. That person, whew, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> but so I remember cranking down the window as a kid and, and, and like reaching my hands out the window and be like, mom, look, I'm catching the wind. I'm catching the wind. And then you would try to show it to, you know, show it to my mom. And, and she'd be like, oh, you know, and in her mind, she's like, you're an idiot. You know, like, like, you know, because you're like, hey, look, I'm catching the wind. And what do you have? You open your hands up and there's nothing. Yet I'm to be pitied because I believe in a risen and reigning king. When I have Jesus and I open my hands, I have everything. Because I have Jesus. I have God with me. In fact, 
Because I believe in his sufficiency of his life and his death in my place. Because I, I'm putting my hope in his finished work for, I can't, I can't do it. I, I've tried. I'm, I, I just lay it down before him and I'm trusting him. And in the victory of the resurrection, I know that those sins have been paid for and covered by his blood. And I have newness of life. Like, I have everything. Way better than chasing after wind. A life to be pitied, to me, seems to be one that is full of working and striving, yet obtaining nothing. Sure, you have money, you have power, maybe you have influence, maybe you have a nice home, you know, maybe you, you, you got all these things, but really at the end of life, you have nothing. It's chasing after wind. Beloved, Jesus is not in the tomb. He has risen from the dead. More than that, he actually sits at the right hand of the Father. The life you live for him isn't to be pitied. It's full of tremendous purpose. Your faithfulness, your surrender, your sacrifice, even your pain and suffering in this life has purpose because he lives. Your life lived for the glory and the, and, and the honor of God is not in vain. It's not to be pitied. It's actually the most important thing. It's life-changing. It gives you hope in hopeless situations. It gives you strength when you're dealing with challenges. And, and it gives you uh, the ability to rejoice even amidst suffering and, and, and sorrow. We can have those things because He is risen. Take a look here at verse 20 and 21 from 1 Corinthians. Paul writes this, but in fact, or you could say, but in truth, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man, talking about Adam, came death, but by a man, talking about Jesus, has come also the resurrection of the dead. We are to be envied because this world, this momentary fleeting world is not the end. Jesus' resurrection is actually a glimpse of the future. Christ is called the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. He is the first fruits. I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not a farmer. Uh, I, I, I don't have a green thumb. But last, last year, we had a, like a, a barrel thing, and had my wife and some of our kids planted some tomato plants. And um, when I would let our dog out in the morning or, or any time I would go out with the dog or to check in things, right there sitting at the middle of kind of our patio was this, you know, flower pot with some tomatoes plants growing. Can I tell you how happy I was when I saw the beginning of a tomato? Like the first one? Like I come back in, I run upstairs, I'm like, there's, there's something growing out there. It's, and you know, like, and then you go out the next day, you're like, ooh, it's a little bit bigger. Ooh, it's starting to change color. Like, we're so excited for one little measly tomato. And I want to be honest with you, I'm talking little because they were cherry tomatoes. So, like, it was never going to be this big, giant, like, beef eater tomato. I mean, it's this little tiny thing. But I was so excited for one tomato. No, because that one tomato showed we didn't kill it. It's going to make more tomatoes. And that's what they're saying here. The, the hope of the resurrection of Jesus is he's the first fruit. He's just a picture of what's to come. If you believe in him, you too will be resurrected. You too will experience the glorification. You will have a glorified body and you will reign with Christ alongside him forever and ever and all of eternity. And we are to be envied for that situation, for that sake those who are in Christ have not perished. They won't fade into oblivion. They will receive a glorious reward. We live. The world thinks it lives, but they don't know what it means to live. But we who trust in the resurrected one know life. We're not to be pitied. We're to be envied. 
The first Sunday after the crucifixion, some women go to the tomb to continue to finish the job of preparing the body of Jesus. And when they arrive there, there's an angel that says, He's not here. He's risen. Just as He said. I've had conversations with people who who say, you know, I, I don't believe in the resurrection, but I think Jesus is a pretty good, you know, spiritual teacher. And I want to say to them, what? That makes absolutely no sense. And like, why? I'm like, because he's a liar then. Why would you follow someone who lies to you? If he says he's going to raise from the dead and he doesn't raise, he's a liar. And if you can't trust him in this, why would you trust him in these things that he has said? It makes no sense If you have no resurrection, we have no faith. But because the tomb is empty, we can say with Paul, as he says here at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, and we can also say with the prophet Isaiah, because Paul is quoting Isaiah, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And then Paul says the sting of death. Death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection has occurred. He is risen. And that truth changes everything. It changes who we are. It changes how we interact with other people. It changes in how we interact with the world around us. In fact, the resurrection flips the world upside down. What seemed like foolishness is actually now the wisest thing in all of the universe. The fact that Jesus is risen, your life has purpose. The fact that Jesus is risen, you can have strength even when you feel weak. You can have hope in a world that's chasing after wind. If there's no resurrection, there's no hope, but church, the tomb is empty. Jesus is risen. He hasn't just risen. He reigns. He reigns. And He is working for your good. There's more hope and goodness found in the resurrection than we can even fathom. If you were to take time and, and extrapolate out all of what that means, I mean, we would be here for days pondering the depths of the goodness of Christ Jesus coming and dying for us. If you don't know the hope of the resurrection, I pray today would be the day. I pray that all of us, if you do know this resurrection, would continue to set our eyes and our hope on that Savior who died so that you would have life, who rose to show that when he said it was finished, he meant it. Let's pray. Lord God, this event, this resurrection is, it's crazy. From our limited human perspective, it's ridiculous. It makes no sense. It's it's unimaginable. How could this happen? But the reality is it did. You raised your son from the grave because he was pleasing. He satisfied the requirements. His life, sacrificed in our place, was sufficient to pay the debt of sin. So that death is no longer ours, but life for all eternity. Lord, I I pray that that if there's someone, Lord, here who, who, who still is wrestling with this and doesn't really grasp the reality of Why is the resurrection so important that that maybe as we just talked about some of these things, that they would begin to grasp, begin to understand, begin to be changed. See that the most glorious news ever to echo throughout the world is that the tomb is empty. He is not here. He is risen. 
And I pray, Lord, for those of us who do know this truth, that it would be more than just knowledge and it would change our lives because he is risen. And that resurrection changes us. We have new identities. We have a new hope. Why? Because the tomb is empty and he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Let us echo that truth in our ears all the days that you give us because it changes everything. We pray this in the risen Jesus' name.